evening and welcome to Tinkering with Edkelar. Yet another piece of test gear. I hope to get to some more consumer grade stuff soon. There's plenty of devices in the queue already. I just prioritize any test gear I get for now, so I can use it on any projects that might come around later. This device is an HP function generator, model number 3300A. Rack mount, pretty much the same case as the distortion meter a few weeks ago. So much so that I had a hard time getting the right parts into the right device again. For its age, the unit looked alright when it arrived. No missing knobs, but lots of grime and uh, is that a bent case? It seems to have taken quite a fall. That is 5mm thick aluminium and almost bent over. The unit has a plug-in opening in the front. The parts that make up that section shifted against each other and the plug-in unit wouldn't quite fit anymore. Everything on the inside is shielded. Nice! Inside the case there is a small plastic enclosure. A quick peek inside confirmed. This is an oven. I only ever heard of those when it comes to quartz crystals. Those run more stable when temperature controlled, but this thing doesn't even have a quartz. Oh well, the insulation foam is keeping the board in for now anyhow. The frequency dial was just as nasty as the one on the distortion meter. I took the liberty of sanding off the coating here too. The aluminium base is nice and it looks plenty good like that in my opinion. The plug-in unit is held in place with a strange lock. When you turn the knob, the locking tab will move between two positions and engage either the frame for locking or another tab behind it and will push out the module during unlocking. 
This way you don't have to pull on the electrical knobs to overcome the 50 pin Centronics plug. Interesting design. Like the distortion meter before, the case is partially riveted together. I'll keep all the rivets in that aren't preventing me from cleaning stuff. In this case, only a few solder points needed to go. This assembly ran into a snag with the plug-in design. The Centronics plug has the wire harness routed through the back cover and I would have to desolder all the pins one by one to remove that. So I'll work around it as good as possible. I tried to desolder all the wires that were in the way, but some were wrapped over their binding posts so tightly that I had to snip them for now. The power socket is a bit on the old side. I really don't like it, but it's quite a bit narrower than the modern IEC connector. I need to cut out a bit of the back panel and to get that rather thick aluminium sheet metal into proper shape, I opted for a bit of milling. Since the wire loom is still holding back the main chassis, I put a bag over it to keep the chips out. Recapping the thing as usual. For the old school main filter caps I found good replacements but those come with screw mounts instead of the tabs. I considered using the old caps as cases for the new ones but most of the tabs broke off during disassembly so I went with a mounting harness. turned out to be quite a bit more complicated than needed because I cut the first part too short. Instead of remaking it, I just added a ring and new tabs. If it fails at first, keep tacking on more stuff. Can you tell I'm a software developer? <laughs> the usual cleaning of the potentiometers and switches commences. Including the plug-in, there's quite a few of those. 7 potentiometers, 2 of which are stereo, 4 sliding and 5 rotary switches kept me busy for some time.
enough. This one has a graphite slider and it didn't quite survive the reassembly process. Oof. Now where do I find such an odd potentiometer? After several attempts on eBay, I decided to fabric cobble something. I replaced the rear cap with an adapter made with OpenSCAD. Then I machined an axle adapter and finally I glued in the adapter to the old potentiometer case and put in a matching trimmer in the rear. Now the original mounting knob will fit while the new trimmer can replace the old potentiometer. To add insult to injury, the other potentiometers were the kind that was pressed on. That means that I couldn't get them apart completely and had to rely on some dabs of oil for new lubrication. And as you might have guessed, I could not resist the oven. I just had to see the inner workings. After a bit of wiggling and slicing off a bit of the drooping insulation, it finally came out of its shell. What a nice assembly! Um, is that rust? And is that a broken pin? Oh uh oh! Good thing I checked. I am pretty sure that the pin on the transistor was broken before I removed it. The transistors are deeper than the heating resistors, so they wouldn't have bumped into the insulation. Looking at the other transistors, all but one show signs of, oh my god, rusted pins or green gunk. When I looked into the schematic for part numbers, I realized these components are hand-picked for best results. And some didn't even have numbers in the schematic, just denote selected component. I ordered a few close enough ones anyhow, and just for giggles, scraped the rust off the pins and soldered on some new wires. There is not much footage of the process, cause I had to work so close, I really almost burned my whiskers. No way a camera would fit anywhere. And much to my surprise, my parts tester reported the correct components for each and every one of my botches. So I put the transistors back in, wired everything up and gave it a quick test. What strikes me as funny is that the pins with the gold plating had rusted and crumbled, the straight tin ones had a layer of greenish calcium on them. I think the oven was exposed to high humidity at part of its life and the heating cycles advanced the aging process. Judging by this device, using a field effect transistor gives better oxidation protection than gold plating.
Following the calibration guide, I set out to align all the components and to make sure that the dial reads as closely to the output frequency as possible. Woohoo! Signal! I was almost done when I tried to adjust the plug-in frequencies. And for some reason, the generator in there worked perfectly fine in the upper frequency ranges, but the lower ones didn't look like sawtooth waves at all. Something seemed to be broken with the caps that drive these ranges. And after much reverse engineering, because I could not find a schematic for the plugin, I finally found the error. I had one of my scope channels connected to the output of the module and used the second channel to poke into the circuit, which seemed to be working just fine. So I assumed some coupling issues from the plug-in socket to the main unit and then it hit me. Classical pepcake error. The keyboard in this case being my DSO. I didn't realize I had the channel set to AC coupling and the low frequencies are really low in this case. So what I saw was a high pass filtered version of the real signal Switching to DC coupling and it works perfectly fine. Dole! Excuse me while I fix the forehead shaped dent in my desk. To finish the case, I decided to remove the rack brackets and put in some blank covers at least. This is where my latest cheap mail order tool came in. Well, let's say the metal brake lived up to its name as it arrived broken. I didn't really want to deal with returns for a 50 kg package, so I took out the stick welder, which blew up halfway through. I had to finish it with an even cheaper older welder, but hey, I finally have a way of cutting and bending sheet metal in a decent way. Now, how does it work? After powering it on, it should be allowed to heat up for almost 30 minutes. This ensures that all the components in the oven assembly are at their desired operating temperature. The frequency range switch offers different decades as multipliers from 0.01 Hz to 10,000 Hz, while the tuning knob range from slightly below 1 to slightly over 10. The total range thus is slightly below 0.01 Hz to slightly over 100 kHz. The output supports three different waveforms, triangle, square or sine. Each of them is available for either of the two outputs. While there is only one frequency for both, the signal can be either. Also, output 2 supports inverted channel 1, i.e. a 180 degree phase shifted version. Output levels can be adjusted individually too, ranging from about 100 mV RMS to about 13.5 V RMS. My unit came with the 3304A plugin. It creates a sawtooth signal between 0.01 Hz and 10 kHz. This can then be used to drive the main unit VCO resulting in a sweep between the selected frequency and a slightly higher one. The second feature of the plugin is a DC offset. To use this, the circuit ground needs to be disconnected from the regular ground, which in my unit came with a capacitor instead of the bridge connector on the rear. Overall, the circuit is rather simple. The oven component is a precision current source that is used to charge a capacitor. The current is controlled with the frequency knob, which just provides a DC voltage, and the capacitor is switched out with the range selection. The charging of the capacitor will then drive an integrator circuit that creates the triangle signal. From here, we have a flip-flop style circuit to create the rectangle, and a set of diodes and resistors that create a pretty awesome approximation of a sine wave. The 
these basic signals are then selected and put into the output amplifiers. There are at least two other plugins available and I'd like to get my paws on them. But they are rare and usually come with the base unit these days and that brings the price up to unhappy regions sadly. So here we have it, a neat vintage function generator up and running to spec again. And this concludes the HP portion of this program. I hope you enjoyed poking at vintage test gear. See you next time! This way you don't have to pull on the electrical knobs to overcome the 50 pins and tronics plugs. Interesting design, and it's not plugs, it's just one plug, darn it!